Okay, let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your great mercy, your grace, your love, your long suffering, your great patience with us. And as we come and gather together to worship around your word and to understand your truths that you have so wonderfully delivered to us in the Holy Scriptures, we do pray that your Holy Spirit will be our teacher, our instructor, and the one that will challenge us to uh, forever change and become more conformed to your image. So speak to our hearts. May your words go forth in boldness and clarity and the power of your Holy Spirit. We submit this time to you in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. So many years ago, I was applying for a job at a Christian organization. And during the interview, the, the man says to me, you know, we like to hire people from good stock, uh, proven families of success in following the Lord. And I guess most of the rest of the interview, I just said, uh-huh, oh, okay, oh, uh-huh, I see. What I really wanted to say to him was, I'm not your guy. I don't come from good stock. When I was going to be born, my parents got divorced. So that was the first divorce in my life. So I guess I'm disqualified for this fellow right there. And during my uh, teen years, I, I was the scourge of the area that I lived in. I was just a disaster, and certainly proving that I was not one of good stock. And my adopted parents, uh, they divorced. And so uh, later on in life, after uh, 15 years of marriage, I got divorced. I guess I'm not from good stock. But it, I wonder, does God really care about our family lines. He cares about the family line of Jesus a lot. But what about us? What about people with a not so good background? People that have had trouble in their life. Can he use people like that? Or does he need people that have always been good and always been right? And those are the main ones he uses. I remember uh, in my younger years in a church, uh, hearing that if someone had too much sin in their life, or they were too dirty, as they put it, God could never use them. They could maybe hand out bulletins or something, but that, you know, that was pretty much it. God uses very clean, right, just people that have always been that way. Well, our passage today is just going to blow all that out right out of the water, because <laughs> that's not true at all. Um, I don't even know if my uh, parents owned any stock. That's as far as all that goes with me, good stock. Well, good luck with that. I heard the story once where uh, some two men were talking and they were reading the Gospels, and one of them said, after reading the story about Peter, he said, I don't know why God ever chose Peter. And why did he ever choose John and Matthew and all these guys? Had, had such... A colorful background, so to speak. And then the man looked at him and said, well, I don't know why God chose you. I don't know why he chose me. Does he choose us because we're really good? Or does he choose us because we're really sick and we need a physician? We need to be healed. We need a God to come into our life and to make us right. He's a good God. He's an almighty God. He can change anybody. He can work in anybody's heart. It doesn't matter who we are or what background we come from. There's different people in the Bible that have pretty bad backgrounds. I guess we're all born that way. Are we all born with a bad background? Are we all born into a family without good stock? I think this passage says that that is true. Everybody that's born into the world is born a sinner who is lost and doesn't know God. We're born dead to him. In Psalm 51.5, David wrote, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. In sin my mother conceived me from the very time of conception. 
I was born a sinner. And then Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and that was Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all have sinned. So maybe this idea of coming from a family of good stock really doesn't carry through when you compare it with the Word of God. So how can we be saved from this awful condition of born into this world as a sinner? Uh, the Jewish leaders one time were talking to Jesus, and they said, well, Moses and Abraham, they're our father. And Jesus said, no, he's, no, they're not. The devil's your father. The devil. How can you say that about us? You know, we're, we're Jewish religious leaders. Well, they're born into this world's sinners. The devil is the god of this world. In this passage before us, in Ephesians chapter 2, we're focusing on verse 3 today. Verse 3 says this, among them whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, then were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. What kind of a past is that? Why does God even care about us? Why does God even love us when he looks at who we are inside, when he looks at what we have been? in the past. Well, in verse 4, it says, but God, in all of our past, we were following this world. We were following Satan. We were letting him work in us to accomplish his will. We were ones that just lusted after everything our little hearts wanted to lust after and desire. Whatever evil thoughts came into our mind, we could go ahead and do them. But then in verse 4, but God, but God comes into our life. And what a difference he can make. He can change us because he changes us into a new creation, a new person in Christ. I thought about a few people in the Bible. Uh, there's a few hundred that I could have looked at, but luckily for all of us, I just chose a few. People that had bad pasts. And yet God used in a mighty way. I don't know if they had good stock. I, uh, from good stock, I, I don't think they really were. Uh, one of them is Rahab, the prostitute. And when, her, when she's called Rahab in the Bible, they always attach that label to her, the prostitute, because that's what she is. But she happens to be in Hebrews chapter 11. And who was in Hebrews chapter 11? Some of the, the greatest saints that have ever lived since man was created. They're in Hebrews chapter 11. Abel is in Hebrews chapter 11. And Moses is in there. All these great men of God and some women of God are in Hebrews chapter 11. And in Hebrews 11.31 it says of Rahab, that she didn't perish with those who were disobedient because she had given friendly welcome to the spies. When the spies sent out from Joshua to, to spy out the city of Jericho to see if they could, how they were going to conquer it, uh, they came to her house, maybe to kind of hide out in a place where people wouldn't, would think it was rather normal for men to go to a house of a prostitute. Well, they came there and then the authorities found out that they, the spies were there, so then they sent the king, uh, his, sent his men there to find these spies. And after she talked to these men, she had hidden them up on her roof. And she says to them, you know, I heard all about what your God does. We heard all about that Red Sea thing with the Egyptians. And she pretty much said, I want to let you know that I'm switching sides. I like your God, and I see what your God is, and as a matter of fact, I think he is the real God. He's the only God, and she said, you know, he's the God that created the heavens and the earth, and I'm sticking with him now, so I'm going to hide you guys, and I'll let you get away, and you can go back and conquer our city. Only one thing I, I ask of you, 
Would you please spare me and spare my family, spare my mother and my father and my brothers and sisters and other people? Would you just do that? And, and they honored that. They did spare her family. And after the city was destroyed, they had set her aside outside the city with her mother and father and, uh, and the rest of her family. And it says she lived the rest of her days in Israel. God had blessed her for what she did. And then you come to the lineage, the lineage of Jesus Christ, uh, tracing him back through history. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, it says this. This is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And it says, And Solomon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab. Rahab the prostitute is in the line of Christ because she had become a child of God. And now that she was a child of God, her past did not matter. What mattered now is whether she served the Lord. And that was good enough. God had made her clean. God had made her righteous. God had made her holy. And someday we'll talk to her in heaven of what it was like hiding those spies and, and what was going through her mind. Because she'll be there. And then there was another man that I, I don't think should have been in the line of Christ. I don't think he should have been an apostle. And that was Matthew because he was the tax collector. And if you would have lived in the country of Israel back in the time of the Roman tax collectors, you wouldn't have liked them because they were nothing but a bunch of thieves. And whatever your taxes were, oh, they taxed on a whole lot more. And they took that for themselves. They were uh, categorized as one of the sinners. Well, Matthew gets saved. He's a tax collector. And then he invited Jesus over his house for dinner. And a bunch of sinners and tax collectors came there. And the Pharisees and the religious leaders were all upset by that. How come your master eats with these kind of people? Because that's who he came to save. He came to save sinners. And there they were. So he was sharing a meal with them. But he got saved. So his, his background as a tax collector, as an evil thief, someone that everybody hated because he was so evil to everyone. I don't know what kind of mom and dad he had, but they, they turned out a tax collector. So I don't know if he was really from good stock. Uh, Alpheus was his dad's name. So, he ends up writing the book of Matthew that's still here with us today. Forever and ever, the word of God will be there because of this man, Matthew, who became a believer in Christ and he was changed and God mightily used him. And then there was uh, another guy. Now this guy, uh, I don't think he had a very good background. He, he certainly wasn't someone that people sought out and wanted to be friends with. If you wanted to be friends with this guy, you had to go to the cemetery because that's where he lived. He couldn't live in a house anymore. And in Mark chapter 5, he lived among the tombs. He had an unclean spirit. And it turns out he had a whole bunch of unclean spirits. And no one could bind him anymore. They had to handcuff and put chains on this guy to tie him down. He was so violent and so evil. And not even a chain can hold him anymore. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart. And he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. And night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and he was cutting himself with stones. And then what happened? But God. But Jesus shows up. And Jesus cast the demons out. This is the story where they came out of him and they all went into the herd of pigs and all the pigs ran over a cliff and drowned in the water. And everybody in the town had heard about something happened to this man. And they all went out there to see. And they came to Jesus and they saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had a legion of demons sitting there he was sitting down, 
He had his clothes on and he was in his right mind. They had never seen anything so dramatic before. And they were afraid. What happened to this man? He met Jesus and Jesus changed him. And then, of course, there was Saul who became Paul. When Saul was first went to Jerusalem, all the Christian leaders in Jerusalem were afraid of him because he was a persecutor of the church. And it took Barnabas to come along and to say, no, he's not a persecutor anymore. Now he's a preacher. He used to kill Christians, but now he makes Christians. He's a different man. He's a new man in Christ. One time uh, I heard a testimony of a headhunter. He was the chief of the headhunter's tribe and the missionary was interpreting. And it was amazing to hear uh, the people that he had murdered. But now, now he led his whole tribe to Jesus Christ as their savior. Now he was a man of God. Once I was a murderer, but now I give life. And then there was Mary Magdalene. In Luke 8, 2, it says, uh, some woman, some women that used to follow Jesus around, they used to take care of him. And they had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. And Mary Magdalene had seven demons Jesus had cast out of her. And they used to provide Jesus with what he needed as he traveled around the countryside. And once she was saved, she would not leave his side. She would not stop helping him. And he never told her to go away because you used to be an evil woman. He never said that. He had made her whole. He had made her well. And she was watching out for him. And then when Jesus was crucified, uh, Mary Magdalene along with the other women uh, including Jesus' mother, they watched where he was buried because they wanted to go anoint that uh, him in that tomb. And they went there the next morning. And the tomb was empty. And Mary Magdalene, she talks to the gardener, and she's in tears. And she's saying, have you seen my Lord? I, I love him, and he's changed my life, and I must be with him, and I don't know where they've taken him. And then this gardener says to her, Mary. And she realized it was the Lord himself. And she falls down and she grabs a hold of his feet. And he has to tell her, uh, you have to let go of me. I have things to do. I have to be resurrected. I have to be ascended back up to my father. So she loved him so much. And so here was a woman that God... The, the wonderful privilege of running to the other apostles and Peter and John and saying to them, the Lord is risen. He's alive. I talked to him and this is what he told me. God changes people and our backgrounds do not matter. Once he makes us clean, we are clean enough for him. We may not be clean enough for other people. But we're clean enough for him, and that's what really matters. So I don't think it mattered to God any bit of any of these people were from good stock. Not at all. So the truth is that once God puts somebody in their family, they, they're in his family. They belong to him. And that is never going to change. So as we look at this verse in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3, talking about what it was like before we were saved. I guess I could have asked that man interviewing me, well, are you from good stock? When you were born, who was your father? Who was your spiritual father? You didn't know God when you were born until you got saved. Well, in this passage, we can look at four characteristics of lost people. And the first one we'll look at is that they all lived among disobedient people. They were all disobedient. So that's the first word we want to think about. They were called sons of disobedience. 
And you notice that Paul says, we all once lived. He included himself. We all lived with the sons of disobedience. And then the second characteristic we'll look at. We all once lived in the passions of our flesh. Our body wants stuff. Why are so many people hooked on drugs today? Because our body wants it and it craves it. Why are so many people have lives ruined by alcohol? Because our bodies want it. And we lived according to that. And then the third characteristic is that we all carry out the desires of our body and of our mind. Our desires, our will. What, what do we will? What do we wish? Well, our minds that are corrupt and fallen would tell us what we want. Our bodies would tell us what we want, and we would do it. So that's the third characteristic. And of course, the last one is that all of the unsaved of this world are by nature, they're children of wrath, like all of mankind. They're all children of wrath. That means that they're sinners and they're under God's wrath. We're not, all the people of the world are, are not all children of God. And that's popular today, but it's not true. And why isn't it true? Because the Bible says we were by nature children of wrath. Like all the rest of mankind were born that way. And it's only when God comes into our life will that all change. So each of these four bad characteristics, when God comes into our life, these four characteristics, he deals with those things. He changes us. He makes sure that we don't have to stay that way. You remember last week we talked about uh, when it says we were all once. And I got intrigued by that word once and started looking at all the times in the New Testament. It says believers were once like this, but now, the other two words, but now they're like this. They're different. They're changed. They're new. So we don't say how we once were. We don't stay that way. Now we become like the new way, like God made us. So each one of these four characteristics have a new way. And we, we gather that from all the scriptures when we find them. And there's a, there's a change that takes place. So we were all once disobedient. We disobeyed God. But now we can obey God because he's given us a will to do that. And where once we were following the desires of our flesh, now we're dead to our flesh. And now we can live for God. It's the old man. We're not the old man anymore. Now we're the new person in Christ. And then once where we did whatever our thoughts and whatever our flesh wanted to do, now we can do what God wants us to do. Couldn't do that before. Now we can say to God, we can, we can say, God, not my will, but yours be done in my life. And then... The fourth characteristic of being children of wrath, not anymore. Now we're children of God. His children. We're the objects of His love to us. So let's look at this first characteristic. Disobedient. They didn't obey and do what God wanted. And disobedient means, you ready for this? means disobedient. It's the word to obey, and in Greek they put an A or an alpha in front of that word, and that negates that word. So it's not obedient anymore. Now with that A on the front of that word, it's now disobedient. It's the opposite of obedient. So, at the end of verse 2, we were sons of disobedient, among whom we all once lived. So, in Romans 2.8, all people do not obey the truth, but they obey unrighteousness. 
I wonder sometimes, and I think this explains a lot of it, that the unsaved of the world, they, they hear the voice of their father, the devil. They hear lies. They hear untruth. And they, they like that. It seems right to them, and they listen to that. And then when they hear the truth that comes from God, they, they can't hear that because God is not their father. The devil's their father. So when we see people believing lies in this world, and there's so many lies in this world that we live in now, when they, when they hear these lies, they sound good to them, and we're going, why can't you see? Why doesn't this make sense to you? Well, because they don't have that capacity. They're dead. They're lost. Spiritually dead. They're disobedient to God. They reject the truth. They refuse to believe. And that happened many times. Paul would try to, he would preach to a group of people and some of them would believe, but some of them would refuse to believe. So in Hebrews 3.18, the Jews were disobedient in the wilderness over and over and over and over again. For 40 years, they were disobedient. And they finally all Perish. All the Jews that were over a certain age of about 20 or so, they all perished in the wilderness because they were disobedient to God. And then in Acts 14, 2, the unbelieving Jews, those who were disobedient when they heard Paul preach, they stirred up the Gentiles and they poisoned their mind against the brothers. And that's what would happen over and over with Paul. He would preach, and then some came to the Lord, but then somebody would go into town, and they would get all the worst of the rabble, and they would poison their minds with a bunch of lies, and they would go try to grab Paul and his compadres and take them uh, off and try to kill them. They were unbelieving. So the Jews were unbelieving. The Gentiles were unbelieving. First Peter, Peter says this, because they formally did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah when the ark was being prepared. When the ark was being made, and, and Noah, a preacher of righteousness, preached to the people, trying to tell them, someday it's going to start raining, and God's going to judge all the people on this earth. And he's going to take them all away if you don't go into this ark. And they didn't obey. They didn't listen to him. And it says they didn't even get it after 120 years of preaching. When the door closed and the rain started to fall and the water started to rise up from the subterranean water wells, then they got it, but it was too late. They were disobedient to the words that Noah preached to them. In John 3.36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains upon him. So to believe in Jesus Christ as the Savior, the only Savior that God has provided, is to obey him. You're obeying the fact that Jesus is our Savior. He is the only one. So if you're disobedient, you're not going to follow. You're not going to trust in Christ as our Savior. But if you're obedient, you will. And then uh, 1 Peter 4, 17. What will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And that's what they're not obeying. The gospel of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news that Christ came to die for a lost and sinning world that was bound to hell for eternity. But now, as formerly being people that disobey God, now we can obey God. We can obey God every day for the rest of our lives. Doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. I guess uh, one time I asked a Christian, when was the last time you sinned? Because he believed you could become sinless. And he thought about it, and I'm thinking, well, you're thinking about it. I was thinking to myself, I, uh, I think I sinned on the way over here to see you. 
<laughs> Matter of fact, I know I did. But he's thinking about it, and then he says, well, I think it's been maybe four or five days, something like that. And I think four or five days? Wow, you're out doing Paul. Because Paul couldn't go that long. But now that we're saved as a lifestyle, it is something that increases more and more. We can obey God. We can do what He wants. And Romans 5.19, For as by one man's disobedience, that was Adam, he disobeyed God. God just said, don't eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he did. So he disobeyed. The many were made sinners. That means all the people of the world became sinners. So by one man's disobedience, by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. By Adam's disobedience, all the world was made sinners. But by the obedience of Jesus Christ, many will be made righteous, not sinners. They will be made righteous because they'll have the righteousness of Christ. He was obedient. In Philippians 2.8, he was found in human form where God became Flesh, God became a human being, all God, all human, without the sin nature. And he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's where God, Christ obeyed God. He had that moment in the garden the night before he was arrested. And, and he said, Father, if there's any way we could do this without me having to go to the cross, could we do that? But nevertheless, not your, not my will, but your will be done. So because he became obedient to God, and he offered his perfect sinless body for our sins, we can be made righteous in him. So our, our righteousness, our standing before God, isn't because we come from a good family, or because we've gone to church all our life, or we read the Bible all the time. It only, be, only comes because... We know Jesus Christ as our Savior from our sins because He is the Savior. We can't shed blood and have it forgive sins. He shed His blood so that our sins can be forgiven. And anything else we try to add, like in, in the Bible times, in the New Testament times, some of the Jews said, well, you have to be circumcised. The Christ's blood wasn't enough, and that's not true. Christ's blood was all enough. And in this, these days that we live in, somebody is always trying to add something to, to make up for whatever they think Christ's blood isn't good enough for. The Father said, the only thing that will satisfy me for the forgiveness of sins of anyone is the shed blood of a perfect person that has never sinned and the obedience of death that he offered his dead body for all of the other people. He stands in their place. He sheds their blood. So in God's eyes, that's the only thing that matters. And we can obey the gospel of Jesus Christ by receiving him as our Savior. And then 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8 when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. You think about that for a minute. Jesus Christ coming back at the end of the seven year tribulation in flaming fire with his angels. And he's inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like the rest of mankind, all the children of wrath, the ones that don't obey the gospel, they have an eternal hell waiting for them. Next week, we're going to talk about that. The people that we know, the people that we don't know, the people we meet, our family members, people we work with, go to school with, whatever, that don't know Christ, they are under God's wrath. And it's our responsibility to let them know the gospel that can set them free. They're children of disobedience, but they can become children of God if someone shares the gospel with them. And that's what God has called us here to do.
to share the gospel of Jesus Christ so they don't experience that terrible thing. So, we're children of disobedience, but God sets us free and changes us. So now we can obey him. So the second characteristic of the lost is this. They live in the passions of their flesh. And the word flesh uh, just means our body. That literally means, it, it's often used, it's just the, the flesh that's hanging on our bones. Put it that way. But then other times in Scripture, it it's clearly has a meaning of our sinful nature. Uh, of the fallen sinful nature that just wants everything for itself. And that's the, basically what our sinful nature is. It wants everything for ourselves. The passions of our flesh. Our, our flesh can be very passionate about what it wants. Uh, some of the older translations just use the word lust, the, the lust of the flesh. Uh, the desires of the flesh. The cravings that our flesh has. That word can be used in good ways and bad ways. In the Bible, it's used in a good way. Somebody that had a very strong desire to do something. Uh, once uh, Jesus said, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you. He didn't lust. He eagerly desired. It's something he really wanted to do. And now when it turns bad for a, a, a human being is when the, be, the human being says, uh, I, I really like the wife of that man, and I'm going to try to take her as my own. That's my passions, my lust, my desire. And that's evil, that's sin, that's wrong. When we live according to that, it causes nothing but trouble in our lives. Nothing but trouble. I look at my own life and I look at the destruction that having strong cravings uh, all the years that I drank too much. Strong cravings. One time a friend of mine said, well, when you feel like drinking, you just call me up and, and I'll talk you out of it. And I said, that won't work. I said, why not? I said, because when I want to drink, I want to drink. And the first person I'm going to call is not you. <laughs> the first person I'm going to call is a cab to take me to the liquor store because I'm too drunk to drive. I won't call you. Because I have such strong cravings, I can't say no. And it's only when God came into my life, he gave me the ability to say no. Well, the only one I could call then was on God, and he saved me. He would give me the strength that I didn't have in myself. How strong are our passions? Oh my goodness. How strong are these desires within us? Paul talks about it in, in um, Romans chapter 7. He struggled so much with these sinful desires within him. He says, the very thing I want to do I know what God wants me to do. I know what his will is for me. But I can never seem to do it. And the very things I know that are totally wrong, that I used to do before I knew Christ, I can't stop doing those things. And then he gets down to the end of the chapter in Romans 7. He, he says, the wretched man that I am. He calls himself a wretched man because there's this battle going on in his body with his old nature and the new nature that God has made. He says, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's who. That's how. God delivers us from the things we don't want to do. I, I think back uh, from the time I was saved long time ago. And I see sins that have hung on all those years. But I also see a nature within me, a new nature that wants to do the right thing. It wants to conquer those things. 
And I see a God that is so patient. He has patience that I wouldn't have with any other person. He puts up with me for decades. Decades and decades. Not just months, not just years. Always teaching me. Always helping me to learn how powerful he is and how utterly weak and helpless I am. Because we are weak and helpless. The more we realize that we can't beat our sinful natures on our own, and that it's only by the power of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit within us, that we can, then we can start defeating our sinful nature. We have to reckon it as dead, because God said, when you were saved, your old self, this, this, this lust of the flesh that wants stuff for itself, it died. It was crucified with Christ on the cross. And it says you have to reckon that so. How does that happen? It happens every day. You learn, and you learn, and you learn. You change. I see God changing me. Sometimes somebody will say, well, how's the church going? I say, well, I think I'm growing more than anybody. I'm pretty sure of that. Because God has been changing me. He's been making me into a new person. Bringing people, bringing things into my life. Uh, I'm a runner. I used to be a long distance runner. But I'm a runner. When problems come, people that I don't like, people that don't like me, I, I leave. I'm not a fighter. I just, I just go away. I'll go somewhere you're not. <laughs> I'll take care of that. And so God brought me to a point in my life where I can't run anymore. Now he brings people into my life that some people have caused great trouble in my life. <laughs> but I can't run away from it. Now I have to stop and face it. And why is that happening? Because God is saying, these are some of your major flaws and defects, and I'm going to work in you and change you. And now things that would have made me run a long time ago. We're just going to move to a nice house in Gardnerville and I'm going to be a greeter at Walmart. No stress, no problems. Except I can't wear a mask because I can't breathe. So now that blows that out of the water. Well, God can change people. He has changed me. He changes all of us. He's such a good God. All these passions of the flesh, these lusts and desires and cravings. In the book of Galatians, he talks so much about these things. The book of Galatians is where I first learned about two negatives in Greek. In the English language, if you have two negatives, you have a no and a no, well, the one no negates the other no, so you don't even have a negative anymore. But in Greek, it's different. If you have one no, that's pretty strong. If you add another no to it, that means no. It's never going to happen. So in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, and this is all talking about the works of our flesh, the desires of our flesh. Paul says this, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And when it says, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, when you're walking by the power of the Holy Spirit, that word not is literally two Greek words put together. The Greek word for no called u, and the Greek word called me. And when you have the Greek word, ooh, that's very strong. The Greek word, may, ah, one chance in a million. When you put ooh, may together, it's never going to happen. When you walk by the power of the Holy Spirit, your desires of the flesh you will not be gratified. You can beat these things. Walk by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then, every believer has the old nature. The one that we're, this is talking about in Ephesians. You were once like that. Well, the once like that is still living in us. And when we're saved, God gives us a new nature. We're a new creation in Christ. And these two natures do not get along. 
Hello. Uh, I haven't watched TV in years, but I do remember an episode of The Simpsons. Ever watch The Simpsons? When he has a homer on one shoulder with a little halo saying, Don't do it, Homer. And the other one over here, the little devil, saying, Do it, Homer. <laughs> He's got two things here telling him they're in conflict, they're in opposition, they're opposing each other. Well, that goes on inside of us. In Galatians 5.17, for the desires of the flesh, they're against the spirit. The desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Now, I find great relief in that. Because when I get so discouraged about not being able to things that I want to do, I can't do them in the Christian life. I know why. Now I know why. Because my old nature is opposed to what the Spirit of God wants me to do. And there's a war going on inside. And then in verse 19, now the works of the flesh. All, all of these desires of the flesh that the unsaved people live by. Sexual immorality tops the list. Impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, Rivalries, dissension, division. Would anybody want to live next to a neighbor that was like this? <laughs> Arguing and fighting and he's always right and causing strife and jealousy. He's jealous. And, and verse 21, he, he's envious of everybody. He's drunk all the time. Orgies, things like these. I warn you about those who do such things or are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit... Now think about this. Would you like to live next to somebody that was like this? They had love. Love your neighbor as yourself. They had joy. Always happy. Always rejoicing. They were peace. They had peace. They were patient with you. They were kind. They were good. They were faithful. They were gentle. They had self-control. Verse 24, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and the desires. We live by the Spirit of God and by the power of God. So these passions that we used to have don't have to control us anymore. Peter just put it this way in 2 Peter 2.11. He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. They're waging war. There's a battle going on inside. And Peter says, abstain from them. Just stay all the way away. Uh, Paul told Timothy, flee youthful lust. Just run from them. And the Holy Spirit gives us the desire and the power to do that. So the third characteristic of the lost is this. They carry out the desires of the flesh and of the mind. The mind is just all of our thoughts, all of the things that run through our head. Do you ever have a situation where thoughts start running through your head and you think to yourself, where in the world are these coming from? Can those be from me? They must be from the devil. They're so wicked. They're so wrong. All of the thoughts that go inside of our heads. And our old nature wants to do those. It wishes to do those. It wants to will to do those. And that's the key word here, is our will. Whatever our thoughts and imaginations want to do, our will says, yeah, do that. <laughs> I heard a, a pastor say, if he had the ability to put everybody's thoughts up on the screen so you could see what the person sitting next to you in church was actually thinking, that you probably wouldn't sit next to them anymore. And this pastor also said, if you could see your pastor's thoughts up on the screen, you would probably fire him. Are we truthful about the thoughts that go on inside of our minds? 
Before we're saved, we can just carry them out. Or maybe all of them we can't carry out. Maybe some of them are against the law and you can't carry them out. When I consider the will of God and, and the will of a person and the conflict that they have, I had over 25 verses that I need to talk about, but I, I won't do that to us. Not 25 verses, so I'll just pick a few. But when we're saved, our new nature wants to do God's will. God has a good will. He willed this whole universe to be created. He created it in six days. And why do I say that? Because the Bible says he did. And if you do truthful science, truthful science says it was made by a designer, and it's very young, the earth. So he willed this whole creation, and then he willed us to be made in his image, and he put us on this earth. He put ducks on the earth so I could enjoy a little duck for a day at the beach. He does that because he's, he's lovely, he's kind, he's good. And, and sometimes we think he's just a big meanie, a big stingy guy that wants to take everything away from us that we like. That's not true. He's a good God. You want to see God's will in the book of Ephesians. It's used several times. And let's think about, is that good or is that not so good? Does that come from a stingy God? that just wants to keep us from having fun or enjoying life, or does that come from a God who is magnificent, overwhelming with goodness? So, in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says he's an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. The will of God called Paul out of a murderous bent in his life to kill Christians, and he made him an apostle. Well, that's a good thing, especially the Christians that live in that time. They would have liked that a lot. Hey, this guy's not trying to kill us anymore. That's a good thing. And then in verse 5, he predestined us for adoption to himself as through Jesus Christ. This was according to his purpose, purpose of his will. He wills to adopt me into his family and make me a child of God. How magnificent is that? That the God of the whole universe that, that is working in this whole world, answering billions of prayers all over this whole world, this great God who has a will, and he wants to make me his son, and he thinks, oh, my son would really enjoy a duck today at the beach. <laughs> I like the fact that he's adopted me in his family and he's my heavenly father and my heavenly father takes care of me and he loves me and he won't let anything hurt me. He's a good God. And then in verse 9, he makes known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of times to unite all things in him Things in heaven and things on earth. God is bringing everything together in this universe. And he has a purpose. And he has a goal that he's working towards. It's the mystery of his will. And he's made it known to us. He's shown us the mystery of his will. How wonderful is that? And then verse 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. His will made sure that I would hear the gospel. His will made sure that, that I would understand what he wants in this world and that I would belong to him. It's all because he wants to. And then in chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. These days are evil. And we're supposed to make the best use of our time. Understand what God's will is. He wants us to know. Do you want to know what God's will is for your life? Ask him. 
Ask him at, at every juncture. Ask him, and he will show. <laughs> and then in chapter 6, verse 6, we're serving the Lord, not as I service, when the servant serves his master, as people pleasers, but as bond servants of God, doing the will of God from the heart. As believers now, we can do God's will from the heart. He's, he's so good to us. He's provided us with so much. And in Colossians 1.9, Paul says, I have never ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. I don't think uh, he really shows his will for us years and years and years in advance. When I was living in my little Tahoe cabin, uh, and I asked God to take my life and that I wanted to do your will no matter what it was. At that time, he didn't show me this house here. And he didn't let my ears hear all those three kids playing. He didn't let me hear all that. He didn't let me see all that. He didn't let me see being pastor of a church. But he led me along every little step of the way. And every step of the way was, was okay. I could deal with that by his strength. And now here I am. So when we ask him, show, us, show me your will for me. He will. Two jobs to choose from, he will. Two, two partners to choose from, who, sh who should I marry, he will. He'll show us. He shows us everything. He's so good to us. He wants us to know his will. And he says, please ask me. So in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, it says this. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. We once were children of wrath, of God's wrath. But now we're called beloved children. We're his beloved children. No more children of wrath. And then in verse 8, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. We have moved from being children of darkness, children of God's wrath, to be in children of light. Jesus is the light of the world. And he's, he's told us we are the light of the world. We can never walk in darkness again. He's showing us his light. His glorious light. And then this is just played out a little bit more in Ephesians, or Philippians chapter 2. Verse 15. Talking about this times, these, this age that we live in. We think this time that we live in is one of the most difficult in history. History has had difficult times all the way through. But in verse 14 of Philippians 2, it says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run or labor in vain. Paul says, you're like light shining in the midst of this world. The world is in darkness, and you could tell people the truth about what's happening. You are people that, that in the midst of all the sin of this world, you can be blameless and innocent, and you are called children of God now, living in this world, in a world of children of wrath, of people that are under God's wrath. We're, we're holding forth the word of Christ, the word of life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the dirt, this world desperately needs that. 
They need to know. I, I look back at my life and I'm so thankful that um, God put things together so that I could hear the gospel. So that a man could come and tell me who Jesus Christ was and that he could change my life. And I wanted that so bad once he told me that I'd never heard that before in my life. Raised in Sacramento, 18 years old, never heard that Jesus died for my sins. A man told me that. And I said, I need that. I want that. He was a bright, shining light to me. And we're to be bright, shining lights to the children that are under God's wrath in this world. They desperately need to hear the gospel. And if we're just hours, weeks, months away from uh, the seven-year Great Tribulation, people need to hear about Jesus Christ so they won't have to go through that. So now, in Christ, what kind of a pedigree do I come from? I come from God. God's my Father. I'm in the family of God. So if I was asked that question again by that interviewer, and he says, we just hire people from good stock, I would say, then you want me, because God is my Father. I belong to the creator of the universe. And he loves me. He holds me in the hollow of his hand. And he'll never let me go. And nobody can take me away from him. He's a glorious God. And he's my savior. I'd be proud to serve him here. That's what I would say now. Yeah. So take this challenge. Take this, these truths. The fact that we belong to God and his family. And we don't have to live the old way anymore. Out with the old, in with the new. Let's pray together. So our Father in heaven, we do pray that your Holy Spirit would reach down into our hearts and do that good work that you fully intend. Take your word and use it in a powerful way in our lives today. And we give you all the thanks that you, being such a great God, have chosen us you have willed to love us. You have willed to bring us into your family. We thank you and praise you. Thank you, Lord. Bless us as we go. We pray for your encouragement. We pray for your love. We pray that your Holy Spirit would carry us through this day because we commit ourselves to you. And we pray in the name of Jesus, your Son, and we do ask that your perfect will would be done. Amen.